My name is Elian Watson, and I am the president of the Washington Society. I welcome you all to this evening's presentation, um, which is um, brought to you by a partnership of eight MAP societies representing all regions around the country. We have um, Boston, Chicago, California, New York, Rocky Mountain, Texas, Washington, as well as the Library of Congress's Phillips, Philip Lee Phillips Society. Um, all of these organizations, um, oh, I'm sorry, and we have also a, a guest um, group this evening, the African American History Club of Ryder Wood, which is a retirement community in the Maryland suburbs of Washington, D.C., um, where a number of our Washington Map Society members reside. So we welcome them tonight as well. Um, so all of these MAP societies are nonprofit organizations that support map collecting um, and the study of maps and um, cartographic history. These groups also support these lectures financially. And um, so if you are not a member, I strongly encourage you to become a member of at least one of these societies. They all have things, um, benefits to, to bring. So please do see the chat. We will be adding links to each of the websites in the chat and you can um, access it there. So benefits vary from each society and um, for the Washington Map Society, we offer our members three annual issues of the Portalon Journal, um, as well as digital access to all past issues of the Portalon Journal on our website, which is um, over 100 issues, and digital access to past guest speaker lectures. We now have over 35 guest speaker lectures on our website. If you're not a member, we do have an introductory rate for first time members of only $5 per first year. So I strongly encourage you to join the Washington Map Society and other map societies today. A few requests for tonight. Um, please do go ahead and mute yourself. Um, that will enable the speaker to um, speak to us this evening. And so make sure you're muting your microphone. If we are recording this meeting this evening, so if you do not want to be seen, please go ahead and video off so that you will not be captured on, on the video. Once um, the speaker has begun, please enter any questions that you might have in the chat feature. You can just type them in. We will address all questions at the end of the presentation. So we will have time for questions and answers, um, but please do use the chat feature for that, for that ability. I will now hand it over to Ron Grimm who is the um, Vice President of the Washington Map Society and the Head of Programs for our group. And he will um, talk about the upcoming lecture for next month. Hey, as of now, we have uh, developed um, uh, meetings through April. Uh, the meetings through March are listed in the current uh, portalin and should be listed on most of the websites of the various map societies. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday evening, January 5 at 7 p.m. The speaker will be Matthew Edney, who is the OSHA professor in the history of cartography at the University of Southern Maine. And he's also the director of the history of cartography project at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. He will talk about the OSHA Map Library's current exhibit which is Mapping Maine, the Land and Its Peoples, 1677 to 1842. Uh, while it uh, focuses on the Native American presence in Maine, it is uh, being uh, mounted and displayed as part of Maine's bicentennial history. And now I'd like to turn the program over to Curtis Wright, the president of the Chicago Map Society and he helped organize tonight's meeting and he will introduce our speaker, Curtis. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Elian. Uh, and thank you also to the rest of the participating MAP societies for allowing the Chicago MAP Society members uh, to enjoy this wonderful lineup of cartographic presentations. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Linda Gartz, an Emmy award-winning Chicago-based documentary producer, author, blogger, educator, and archivist. Her presentation, which is entitled How Federal Government Redlining Maps Segregated America, is based on her recent publication titled Redline, a, memory of a memoir of race, change, and fractured community in 1960 Chicago. Uh, before we begin, I want to bring your attention to several links I included in the chat box. 
Um, these will take you to the Mapping Inequality website, which will be discussed at length in Linda's presentation, uh, as well as Linda's personal website, which has more information on her book, Redlined. I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentations. Uh, if you have questions, please wait until the end uh, where I will be moderating the questions submitted through the chat box. Uh, and now I will turn things over to Linda. Okay, well, thank you, Curtis. And uh, thank you to uh, everyone in the various MAP societies around the country for inviting me. And I wanna give a special shout out to Curtis because he's done a lot of work and put a lot of effort into making this the, um, the best kind of presentation that we can possibly give to you all. So uh, let's see, I'm going to wait, I think is the, um, power, is the PowerPoint all set? It looks kind of big on my screen. Can sure. everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, it's. Uh, it looks. Yes. It's very. It's a little too big. If we can reduce its size. Linda, this is full screen. Um, so I'm not sure if we're going to make it any smaller. Your your video will appear in the upper right um, of folks' screens. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, so um, let's go on. Let's start with. Um, let's get started. So let's go to the slide number two, which is uh, an image of my book. Um, so. I wrote this book about family and real estate. And at its most basic, Redlined is the story of my family's lives on Chicago's West Side before, during, and after the racial changes of the 1960s. And it's interwoven with the history and impact of redlining because we lived through that. Um, so redlining also, I would like to give you a brief definition of red, redlining. We can go to the next slide for that. Um, at its, again, at its simplest, redlining in America was the federal government's discriminatory policy of refusing loans, especially home loans, to African Americans and other minorities from 1933 to 1968, based on color-coded maps. And the impact of this policy is still with us, as we'll be able to uh, see as we go through this um, as we go through this presentation. Um, the book covers several decades. Um, uh, but it really focuses on the 60s. And I think that most of us would agree that the 1960s were probably one of the most, if not the most tumultuous decades of the last century. Um, here, I just picked one image. I could have picked so many from, um, from that era. This is the 1968 Democratic Convention, the melee between pol Chicago police officers and demonstrators at that convention. And of course, 68 held so many horrors. We had the murder of Martin Luther King. We had the murder of Bobby Kennedy. In January, we had the Tet Offensive at my school, Northwestern. African Americans took over one of the administration buildings. Uh, we had the trial of the Chicago 7 starting. It was just, uh, it was a horrendous year. And the 60s in general had just so much upheaval with the civil rights movement and the uh, protests against the Vietnam War and so on. So you all, I think most of you remember that. Um, but, you know, I think I could make the, uh, the argument that we are, and I think you'd all agree, we're in a very tumultuous era again. Um, now we are facing both a racial reckoning after the murder of George Floyd and, of course, this pandemic that has had us all hunkered down since March. Um, now, with the pandemic, um, as of yesterday, more than 270,000 Americans have died from COVID-19. But the fact is that African Americans are dying at twice the rate of white Americans. And I can believe I can draw a direct line from that fact to redlining. Um, Non-Hispanic Blacks, that's to differentiate non-Hispanic Blacks from Hispanic Blacks. Non-Hispanic Blacks are hospitalized at four and a half times the rate of non-Hispanic whites. Um, and I think the murder of George Floyd let us let most of us realize and see in real time the danger of being a black man in America. The implicit bias that allowed George Floyd um, to be murdered uh, as, as casually as he was by Officer Chauvin, I think shows the uh, implicit bias that is uh, that works through many police departments and it's not something that's unique to police officers. We all have implicit bias. It's those kinds of biases that we're just not aware of. But after, um, and that's a form of systemic racism, as is redlining. So we'll we'll be talking a lot more about that. Okay. So after George Floyd's death, these protests ro 
arose around the world almost spontaneously. People just, you know, couldn't couldn't believe what they had seen. And I think it was the first time in many uh, decades that white Americans first for the first time understood what black Americans had been talking about for decades. They had actually seen um, a black man being killed right in front of our eyes. So there was global anger over his death. Um, and, you know, I want to go to the next slide to talk about uh, another era of frustration and anger. Um, during those protests, most of which were peaceful, however, like with many protests, you have bad actors, anarchists, criminals, who liked to sow chaos, who took advantage of the protests. They were setting fires and breaking windows, looting stores. This is an image of an exhausted store owner, Wasid Musa, sitting amidst the rubble at his looted store, African Food and Liquor, which is located at the 4100 block of Madison Street. For those of you who are not from Chicago, Madison Street is a major thoroughfare that starts in downtown Chicago, uh, just about near the lake, and goes all the way west through um, my former neighborhood and into um, Oak Park, which is the neighborhood, um, the community that's right next door to our community where I grew up. So when I saw this image and saw the looted store and all the, the rubble on the ground, it was uh, just two and a half, just about two blocks away from where I grew up. And it was a deja vu moment for me seeing this, this aftermath of the looting. And it took me back to 1968 again um, the riots after Martin Luther King's death. And this is an, an aerial image uh, from the day after, pardon me, <clears throat> the day after King's death, um, the entire West Side went up in flames. And when I say in flames, I mean, it looked like Dresden. Um, you could go to my website on the first homepage, and there I have a video trailer of the book, and I have some film of this of these um, fires raging as far as the eye can see and the firefighters wrangling hoses, trying to get it under control. When, um, when it was done, uh, here's a picture of the next day. Um, the next day, well, first of all, I'll just make a couple of comments. Nearly 200 cities across America exploded in riots. Chicago was one of the hardest hit. We had nine people killed, 1,200 injured, and over 200 buildings were destroyed, nearly $9 million worth of damage. But the super damage that was done was to, to the communities, the African-American communities um, that were just left with almost nothing. If we look at the next picture, which shows the day after the um, riots, the picture, the image on the left shows um, just the charred rubble of buildings, the skeletal remains. Then the bulldozers came in and tore them down. And what was left were, you know, scores of empty lots strewn throughout the West and actually South side of Chicago. And um, the sad thing is that on the right hand side is a picture just taken in 2018 of an area right near where I grew up. Um, for those of you who live in Chicago, this is actually near around um, Monroe and Kedzie those street names are not as familiar as Monroe and Kedzie. Um, but it just shows you how in 52 years, how our, this neighborhood is still struggling. And as a matter of fact, when you look at the murders in my former neighborhood, in my one precinct, they are higher than in all of Minneapolis um, right now. So that was a fact that just came out in the last couple of days. Now, at the time of these riots, my parents still owned several apartment buildings on the west side of Chicago. They owned three small apartment buildings. And in, uh, I don't know, can everybody else see the image here? Because I'm having it cut off. Um, we can see it. You can see it? OK, good. Um, OK, I know it's there, so. <laughs> OK, so this is uh, the two flat, a beautiful graystone two flat that my parents bought in December of 1958 and they moved in in June of 1959. Now in 1950, when the, the study was done, the population of West Garfield Park was nearly 100% white. Out of a total population of 48,443 people who lived in that neighborhood, only 23 identified as black. So um, my, pop, my father and my mother wouldn't have even given a thought to that statistic. They knew it was an all white neighborhood. They wouldn't have thought of anything else. So they bought this home uh, as an investment. And, um, you know, as 
and what actually was going on is my dad was kind of following in the footsteps of his father. Let's look at the next picture. Okay, here we have a picture of what brought my grandfather, Joseph Gartz, he was originally Yosef, um, to, to the West Side. In 1912, he got his first good paying job at Joe Nelson's Saloon. For those of you in Chicago, that's on the corner of Madison and Pulaski. Uh, this is a, was a vibrant, um, well, in 1912, the, the neighborhood was just beginning to get started. But in the picture on the left, this is a saloon with all these guys lined up with their schooners of beer. And at that time, if you um, bought a schooner of beer for five cents, you got a free sandwich with it. And my grandfather's job was to make the sandwiches. And on the right is the same picture. I just was able to get a close up of him. And if you can see it, the 1912 calendar is right behind his head. So he was a young man. And um, he was determined to make his way in America without any language skills at the time and a very, only a fourth grade education. Well, he married my grandmother who was as hardworking and ambitious as he. And eventually he got into the janitorial business. Um, he ended up being in charge of 65 apartments to take care of. In addition, he was managing several buildings and they worked and saved obsessively for decades to be able to finally buy a home of their own, both ribbon and for investment. It was the immigrant dream. It was the middle-class dream to be able to own a home. Um, now let's look at the next picture. Um, if this doesn't look like a solid middle-class family, I don't know what would. This is a picture taken in 1933. Everybody's dressed in their Easter best. And um, my grandmother liked to take these pictures regularly so that she could send them back to the old country and let everybody know how well they were doing. Um, they certainly didn't dress like this in their workaday world. But what is interesting to me about this picture is that my grandparents were able to invest in property and achieve the immigrant and American middle-class dream but African-Americans were denied that possibility of homeowner, home ownership at the time my grandparents were able to buy. So um, my parents felt that, you know, gee, it, this had worked really well for my grandparents. It, would, it was on top of my dad's day job. So what could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> well, they didn't realize that they were living on a fault line of history. Um, and they couldn't anticipate the racial upheavals that were to come less than two decades hence. And they also couldn't anticipate how the house itself would grind away at their love and relationship. So these, were, these are the themes that I end up exploring in Redlined because they bothered me. We, this unanticipated racial upheaval, I didn't understand what had caused that. Uh, the impact of redlining on communities my parents' shifting relationship, and then the impact of mental illness on my family. Uh, this is an image of my mom on the left and her mother. We called her Grandma Koroshetz, Grandma K. And my grandmother, um, my mother's mother was seriously mentally ill, seriously. And she lived with us for 15 years total. So that took a great toll on our family as well. And these are all um, themes that I, I explore in the, um, uh, in the book. Now, what caused me to write the book? Well, it was a startling event. In 1994, after my mom's death, my brothers and I were going through my parents' home, separating trash from treasure. And in the attic, we found our gold. We found that my parents and grandparents had saved thousands and thousands of pages of letters, diaries, documents, photos, you name it, they saved it, union pins. And so we didn't have time to go through it. We separated it all into 25 bankers boxes based upon um, the, the person about whom that box held information. And they ended up being stored in my garage. Um, and this is some of them. Some of them are in my house. I just wanna give you a sense of the, the extent of this uh, collection. Let's go to the next slide. Um, what we did is we created spreadsheets to document the contents. And this is just one of 10 pages. I don't expect you to be able to read it. It's a little out of focus. It's just to give you an idea of how we tried to document the details of what were in these boxes. And then one more image just to give you a sense of it. Uh, this, I just spread a tiny portion of the um, archives onto the floor and took a picture of them. This is a tiny portion from one box. So this gives you, I hope, a little bit of a sense of what I was dealing with here when I um, 
when I finally got into it. So they sort of stayed in my garage for many years. I was busy raising two young boys. And then, you know, early 2000s, a tiny nagging voice kept, you know, talking in my ear, I wonder what's in those boxes. So I decided to pull out the first box that was of interest to me, which is the letters that were to and from my uncle Frank Abnergartz when he was studying to be a navigator. And those letters whisked me back to the 1940s. I felt that I was immersed in the daily life of my grandparents and parents. And it, it, vivid writing, um, lots of st stories about home because what else do you write to avoid the nervous in the service and I was hooked. So I started pulling out more and more um, of the letters and diaries and reading them. And the one that really uh, transfixed me the most were the diaries that my mom kept of falling in love with my dad. And we have an image here of her diary. She was very fastidious and on the front, she noticed the dates she put in there. Uh, November 20th, 1939 to October 20th, 1941. Well, in this diary is where she meets my dad. And I'll just give you a brief overview of what happened. She goes to a dance in May of 1941, May 10th, and she sees my dad. She'd met him once before, but had, had a wonderful time with him, but he'd never asked her for a date. So this is another chance. She goes up to him, you know, he invites her to join the group. They fall into conversation. They dance the night away. And when she got home, she wrote in her diary. So this is what she wrote. And I'm going to read it directly um, from the book. This is, now remember, this is their, the first time together since the previous November. There's no doubt about it. I'm in love with him. He's really the first man I've met that I think I'd like to marry. Intelligent, crazy, fun, and we have no end of things to talk about. Well, all I can say is my dad must have been pretty slow on the uptake with a girl giving those kind of vibes. It took him three months to ask her out for a date. So he finally asked her out for a date. And let's just take a look at the next picture. Um, this picture on the right is actually on their third date, but it's in August of 1941. And... Um, my mom and dad finally go out on a date on August 15th of 1941. And um, they have a great time. They walk through Lincoln Park. For those of you not from this area, Lincoln Park is a beautiful park near the, near the lake and it also has a zoo in it. And that comes to be talked about in the diary. Uh, they went to a movie, they went to a brewery to have a nice cold beer and some ham sandwiches. And then they went back to the park. And when my mom got home, she wrote this in her diary. I, I, and on the left, I actually have a little portion of what she wrote because we never see handwriting anymore. And also shorthand, which is, uh, this is Pittman shorthand. I guess something got kind of racy. She wanted to hide it. I think we both knew why we went back to the park. We sat on a bench hearing the lion's roar and the quacking of a duck. Oh, it was heavenly. He knows all the little innuendos of kissing and I ain't so bad myself if I do say so. We kissed for about an hour and a half. Tonight was like a page from a storybook and he definitely is the man I want to marry. Dear God, please let it come true. Well, these kinds of ecstatic entries continue on for their whole dating time. The rest of 1941, of course, we entered the war in December um, all the way through the next year. And in May of 1942, my dad finally finds his voice and this is what my mother wrote about what he said. Fred told me at 2.30 a.m. Sunday, May 17th, really that he loves me. One split second before he did so, I murmured, je t'aime, which of course he did not understand. Ever since then, we have been happier than ever before in our lives. Fred tells me the nicest things, that he loves me more all the time, that I get sweeter as time goes by, that he's never loved anyone half as much as he's loved me, and he's wanted many things badly in life, but never anything as much as he wants me. We have never had an argument since our first date, August 15th, 1941, so if we won't be happily married, who will? Well, by the time I was a teenager, I can tell you my parents were definitely not happy. My mom was screaming at my dad um, that he had saddled her with this rooming house and left her to do all this work. Um, then he would retreat because he hated confrontation. So I was completely confused because I, I didn't see any animosity between them when I was growing up. 
Uh, and it made me very sad. And I thought maybe if I went through the letters and diaries, I could find out what had happened to their relationship. But there was another puzzle I wanted to solve, and that is what had happened to my neighborhood. And for that, I had to do some research. Um, and do, in doing that research, I learned about redlining and the Great Migration. So I'm just going to take a minute here to read from my book um, a couple of pages, won't take long, about the Great Migration. Hold on one second, please. Okay, what we see here is an image um, of a Great Migration family that arrived in Chicago. Um, but let me read this first and I'll get into the details about this picture. Like most major cities in 20th century America, Chicago was rigidly segregated. African Americans were clustered primarily on Chicago's near west side and in the south side's Black Belt, a strip of land that stretched from about 28th to 70th Street in 1940 and inexorably expanded as Blacks flocked to the city. For those of you who don't live in Chicago, if you can picture Chicago along the lake and then just go west a little bit, that's the near west side, and then getting south of, um, of uh, downtown Chicago, we number our streets very regularly. So downtown, like Madison Street is zero, and then each, each uh, block south gains a number. So we're talking here about 28 blocks of downtown Chicago to about 70 blocks. That was the black belt. And anyway, in that, this Black Belt inexorably expanded as Blacks flocked to the city. Chicago's Black population had been burgeoning in these two neighborhoods ever since the beginning of the Great Migration, when vast numbers of Southern Blacks moved to Northern states in California starting near the end of World War I and gaining steam in a second wave after World War II. In the 1940s and 1950s, three million Blacks fled North from the daily degradations and abuses of the grim Jim Crow South. Hundreds of thousands headed to Chicago, where the Black population nearly tripled from 278,000 in 1940 to more than 812,600 in 1960. Like my parents, many whites remained unaware that this ma massive population shift was underway or the reasons behind it. They just knew they didn't want African Americans moving into their white neighborhoods. Most whites were certain that Blacks brought decay and dilapidation into every community they entered. When I was young, we sometimes drove through African Americans on our way, excuse me, through African American neighborhoods on our way elsewhere and witnessed blight firsthand. Sagging porches and dirty windows, no grass, only twisting weeds and dusty front yards, ill-clad little children playing in the street. A ferocious white backlash erupted when Blacks moved into an all white area. In July of 1953, a couple purchased a home in all white South Deering on Chicago's South Side. For months, white crowds protested and rioted, hurling bricks, shooting off pistols, and attacking black passersby. One of the picketers proclaimed to a CBS reporter that she didn't want blacks in her community because, quote, every place they've taken over, they've turned into a slum, end quote. Whites were certain Blacks would devastate their communities and alongside that would destroy Whites' greatest investment, the value of their homes. In her epic book about the Great Migration called The Warmth of Other Suns, I highly recommend it, Isabel Wilkerson writes, she's the same person who just, you probably heard all about in her new book, Cast. So this was her first book called The Warmth of Other Suns. It was an article of faith among many people in Chicago and other big cities that the arrival of colored people in an all white neighborhood automatically lowered property values. She continues, that economic fear was helping propel the violent defense of white neighborhoods. The fears were not unfounded, but often not for the reasons that white residents were led to believe. Now, before I get into the next part, I just wanna talk a little bit about this picture. Um, this is a picture of a great migration, uh, a family from the great migration. Uh, you see the subtitle, I mean, the caption says a Negro family just arrived in Chicago from the rural South. Um, well, this picture, if you Google the great migration images, this picture will always come up. It's a very famous picture, but for years, uh, nobody knew who this family was or what this was about. Uh, this 
picture was published in the book called um, The Negro in Chicago, A Study of a Race Riot. And that was the 1919 race riots. And this was the Chicago Commission on Race Relations that was trying to understand um, what this meant for race relations in Chicago. But the picture itself was a puzzle until uh, Vernon Jarrett, who is a um, who was a Chicago te television reporter and also a journalist, he did some research and he found out uh, what the origin of this picture was. And we're going to take a look at the next slide because this is where this picture first appeared. Um, it appeared on the front page of the Chicago Defender. For those of you who are out of town, the Chicago Defender is a very famous African-American newspaper that was founded in the early 1900s. And it was actually snuck into the South during Jim Crow era because uh, blacks could get in a lot of trouble from whites if they knew they had this, but it encouraged um, African-Americans to go North. So in this case, we see, um, we see this picture of this family with the title headline, Family Driven from the South by Mob. Now you can't read the caption, but I'll read it. Um, facing starvation, Scott, Arthur, and his family were driven from their home like dogs, girls assaulted, sons burned at the stake by a Paris, Texas mob, arrive in Chicago without money and homeless. A little research I did on this tells me that uh, the clothes they're wearing were actually provided by a, a society that, that met them there. So this is the kind of terrorism that Blacks were facing at the time and uh, was you know, contributing to the Great Migration. So um, I was had read to you a little bit about coming north, and now I'm just going to read a little bit more. Um, we heard that terrible um, quote of that woman saying every place they've come into, they've turned into a slum. Years later, I learned that the real culprits behind the decrepitude and the lowering value of white homes were the policies of the federal government in alliance with the real estate and mortgage sectors. In the 1930s, the newly created Home Owners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, along with the Federal Housing Administration and other government agencies, began ranking communities to assess their credit worthiness from A, green the highest, through D, red the lowest. So now we're gonna take a look at this map what you're all waiting for. <laughs> um, okay, this map shows how widespread redlining was. Um, you can see it, it spans all the way from the Northwest in Seattle down to the Southeast in Miami. It seems to be really clustered a lot in the Midwest and on the Eastern, on the Eastern coast. But um, as you can see, these, um, most of the cities are, are primarily labeled as yellow and red. Um, we'll get into that in a minute, but um, 19, in 1935, eight, Hulk, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, created residential security maps for at least 239 cities to guide real estate investment. Um, so what we're going to do now, it, it, I just if you can see on the left, the, um, the color coding map, the color code key for these colors, green was A, that was the best, that meant it was all white and had good quality um, structures. B was still um, desirable. That would be blue, so that was pretty good. Um, yellow was called definitely declining, and that could be a little iffy. It's kind of like caution, be careful. And red was like, stop, do not give loans in this neighborhood. And frankly, the presence of even a single black person in a neighborhood, whether he was a veteran or a PhD, didn't matter, it could disqualify him um, and, and that whole neighborhood would be redlined. And, and nobody then in that neighborhood could get a loan, not just the black people, nobody could get a loan. The whites could flee, the blacks really couldn't. So we're gonna use uh, this map to take a look at a couple of specific um, areas in Denver and in Los Angeles. Uh, we know the Rocky Mountain Map Society is located in Denver and the California Map Society is located in Los Angeles. So we're gonna take a look at those two cities. So let's first start with Denver. Um, now, let's see, this is a problem. I can't really, okay, there we go. As we see the part that's circled there in red is uh, called D12, D for the grading of red and 12 just identifying the neighborhood. Let's look at the language. This is a better Negro section of Denver and is one of the best colored districts in the United States. The Northeastern part is often referred to as the Negro Country Club. 
uh, this isn't the entire description, but we've just pulled out some salient portions. For a Negro section, it is very well kept up. Were it not for the heavy colored population, much of it could be rated C. In financing home ownership, the better class Negroes usually obtain loans from institutions, but others are victims of industrial operators who have high fees and high interest rates. And we'll get into that later. Sometimes it was called contract buying here in Chicago, it was. But it's interesting to just note, um, you know, as they said there, if this word didn't have colored people in it, that was the common verbiage at the time, Negroes are colored, um, then it could have been rated a higher neighborhood. So it sounds like a great neighborhood, except it's got black people. So it gets a D rating, no loans. Um, now we come to an A rated area in Denver. It's green, it's called A3. Here it says Denver's most intense activity and in construction of the better types of houses is centered in this area. A house, now here's a, an interesting, another type of discrimination. A house was recently sold to, this is probably supposed to be either Jews or a Jew or a Jewish family, in Crestmore brought summary action in barring the builder from future work in the area. So because this builder sold to a Jewish family, pardon me, <clears throat> to a Jewish family, he was barred from any future work in the area. Um, and then I'm just going to go with the last one. Detrimental influences, none outstanding except the uncertain influence of the nearby Army Air Corps Technical School. So they were just, you know, a little concerned about that, but they gave it an A rating of a green. So now we're going to look at two areas, a green and a red area in Los Angeles. Um, so if this is a, a Los Angeles D50, again, D for red and 50 to designate the neighborhood. Um, if you go just a little northeast of where this red circle is, that is where downtown LA is, just a little to the northeast. I happen to know that because my son lives there. Um, okay, here's the description for this area. 40 years ago, this was a good medium priced residential district, but since deed restrictions expired some 10 years ago, it has rapidly become infiltrated is what they mean to say with Negroes and Japanese. And by the residential, um, the deed restrictions, they're talking about those racially restrictive covenants, I guess they had expired. And so the problem is now it's being, they use a term like infiltrated for the, um, for these two races. It is considered the best Negro residential district in the city. Stability of values and evident pride of ownership. The area is accorded a high red grade. And then it tells you the people who live there, the income is 800 of the people uh, there, 800 to 2,400 a year. So despite having stability of values and the evident pride of ownership, it still is rated D. And I don't know what that means, high red grade. I would think that Maybe they're just saying someone who wants to take a chance can take a chance. So let's look at the next one, the next slide, uh, which will should also be LA, right? Oh, we, am I, did I jump ahead? The, this green area, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so this green area of Los Angeles, it's got the highest grade A, and uh, it says deed restrictions limit improvements to one and two story single family dwellings with architectural control, uniform setbacks, and here's the key provision, and protection in perpetuity against subversive racial elements. Okay, so these are probably those racially restrictive covenants they're talking about. Um, anyway, the population is homogeneous. That was extremely important to the FHA and to Hulk. They actually, well, we'll see this, they state in their, in their uh, manual that they want, they expect that people of the same race and class should live together. Um, and then it says, well, this area has all the physical characteristics of the highest grade. This factor coupled, coupled with its being surrounded by lower grade districts leads to the assignment of a low green. Now again, low green, high red, I guess just giving the banks a heads up. Class and occupation, business and professional men, notice no women, minor executives, white collar clericals, et cetera. The income is about double what it was in the, um, in the area that was, that was labeled red. So we can see that um, the language, this is throughout these maps. If you go on mapping inequality, if you Google that and you see these maps and also take a look at the 
um, what they say about them, you'll be amazed. Okay, let's go on to my uh, city, Chicago. This is uh, a red line from downtown to Chicago, directly west five miles to where my house is. You see the little arrow. Um, so I lived um, just directly west. This is where I grew up of downtown, um, of downtown Chicago. And um, you can see here, this is not a whole map of Chicago, obviously, but we've got a lot of red and yellow. And on the right, uh, very far right near along the lake, you can see the greens, greens and blues, because of course, those um, were highly desirable areas. Um, now, blockbusting and race, bait and race baiting were a real problem um, in this area. Because of the redlining, uh, unscrupulous real estate agents knew that they could um, scare white people into selling cheaply, and then they could turn around and resell the houses at a higher cost to blacks. And I can remember uh, flyers that would show up in our hallway that would say things like, you better get out before it's too late or a phone call at night where the caller wouldn't identify himself and he'd say something like, they're coming, click, and that was it. Um, so White started selling very cheaply to get out. They, as they told him, you better get out before it's too late. And then these unscrupulous real estate agents would turn around and sell the houses to Blacks on contract because they couldn't get a mortgage. And um, to be selling on contract meant that you'd never the, the purchaser never owned a deed to the house. They only um, were paying it off like you'd pay off an outfit at a, at a local store. And they could have paid 50, 60, 70 percent of the of the value that, that the building was rated at. And if they missed one payment, they would be evicted. And many of these blockbusters resold homes over and over again. Um, there's a great article called Confessions of a Blockbuster. I have it on the resource page of my website. Just go to book drop down menu resources, and you'll see lots of resources about all sorts of, um, about redlining and uh, blockbusting and so on. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Now this is a close up of my neighborhood. If, if you picture that red line going all the way to the west, here you see an orange arrow where I lived at 4222 West Washington. These um, X's uh, indicate a commercial district. And we had an absolutely vibrant commercial district in our neighborhood. They had every kind of store you could imagine, hardware stores, bakeries, paint stores, um, two, two dime stores, restaurants. It was like a small town. You could get anything you needed in this neighborhood. Um, but for some reason, the uh, in, in their minds, this was still a definitely declining neighborhood, which we did not see at all. We would have never, I don't think my parents would have bought a home. Uh, in 1948, when it was labeled definitely declining in 1940. So that was, that's just the way it was at the time. So um, this gives you a sense, the FHA underwriting manual states that these are actual quotes, the, if, that they want the protection against adverse influences, including the prevention of the infiltration of inharmonious racial groups. They don't want blacks and whites living together. They made this decision. Uh, to maintain a neighborhood stability, it should, quote, continue to be occupied, end quote, by the same social and racial classes. And what's interesting is that nearly 65% of the areas graded hazardous and redlined now are minority neighborhoods still today. Um, so let's see what this meant. What was the damage of redlining? Um, there is still damage today, as we can see in the next slide. Um, pollution is heavier in black and, I'm sorry, on this slide, in black and Hispanic neighborhoods. And of course, we know that pollution increases the risk of getting, I mean, if, if you have pollution, people develop asthma, they have lung issues, that increases the risk of getting COVID-19, which is why we're seeing blacks dying at double the rates and being hospitalized at four and a half times the rate. Um, there's also a financial impact. A Brooking Institution Gallup study found that the average home in a majority black neighborhood is undervalued by 48 thousand um, dollars when compared to let's say an identical white um, an identical home in an all-white neighborhood so this represents about 156 billion dollars in cumulative losses to black home ownerships home ownership um, and we're still paying the price for the systemic racism that uh, that came with um, with redlining Chicago has the largest life expectancy gap between blacks and whites of any large city in the country. There's a 30 year difference in communities that are just nine miles apart. Streeterville residents, for the, again, for those of you not familiar with Chicago, that's on the lake, 
in near the Gold Coast, uh, you know, the Michigan Avenue Gold Coast. Um, whites there expect to live to about 90. Um, Englewood residents five miles away in Chicago's south side, mostly African American, on average die by the age of 60. And I can tell you that if you go to West Garfield Park, where I grew up, the same would be, would be true there. So redlining created segregation in underfunded communities. And so black neighborhoods are gonna see more of concentrated poverty, air pollution, which creates these underlying respiratory conditions we just talked about. There's also extreme heat in a lot of these redline neighborhoods. Um, they can be up to nine degrees hotter in the summer than uh, in white neighborhoods because there's often a lack of trees and, um, it, and a lot of concrete. Um, there's less access to health there, you know, and quality food. Many of you, I'm sure, have read, read about, you know, food deserts. Well, that's it's very hard for people to get to um, to get good food. They have to, and the transportation is not always uh, well structured. So it, it, it's just a mess in every possible way. Uh, and as we said, twice as many blacks are dying from COVID. So across the United States, redlining has really devastated. I mean, the coronavirus has devastated communities of color and the coronavirus is often, um, has often attacked uh, or affected black communities at a much higher rate than whites. Um, then there's the wealth gap and this is a huge issue. Black families were unable to invest in property from the mid thirties until 1968 when the FHA um, ended official redlining. It still exists, but a little more subtly. I won't go into detail uh, on that because we're running out of time. But um, because Blacks were unable to invest in property, they were unable to accumulate wealth and intergenerational wealth. So think about it. You buy a piece of property, that property increases in value. You can pass that value on to your kids. You can pay for college. Black families were not able to do that. They didn't have a backup for what we see happening right now with um, COVID, um, with all this uh, people being losing their jobs, there's no cushion there. So the result is that today Black families hold only about 5 to 7 percent the wealth that white families have. Um, and that's, I was reading one study that it would take like, it's going to take like about 260 years if the present conditions continue to catch, for Blacks to catch up with whites. Um, so anyway, uh, that, I want to leave a little time for, for <laughs> For Q&A, um, as I said before, this book interweaves the history of my family on the West Side um, with the history of redlining. It's a memoir. It's not an academic book. I, if you really want to read an academic book, there are many wonderful ones out there. You can find them again under resources on my web website. But I'm thinking that if you don't want to read an academic book, this one combines a good family saga and gives you the history of redlining. Um, please remember to check out the chat box for links um, for both um, mapping inequality. And um, there's a special page in there called Look for the Social Vulnerability. It, they, what they did recently, they're updating the site. They put two maps side by side, an original redlining map, and then a map that shows where the most COVID cases are. So it's very instructive in seeing um, actually where the neighborhoods are redlined and where the highest number of COVID cases are. So um, anyway, I really hope this was interesting to you. I was delighted to be invited and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful, thank you very much, Linda, uh, for that powerful and revealing personal presentation, um, especially personally considering I'm just at 32nd and Ogden. Um, so well within that black belt that you referenced. So. Uh, an interesting part of, of Chicago's long racial history. So um, I would like to open it up to questions now. Um, I think that we've had a few comments uh, in the chat box that I encourage everyone to look through. But if you guys have questions, um, feel free to submit them to the chat box now or pop on in uh, if you're feeling adventurous in the video. I will again um, enter the links into the chat box for the Mapping Inequality website, um, as well as a link to Linda's personal website uh, and a link where you can get her book at the Newberry website. Um, so Linda, we got a question, why did redlining begin in the year 1930? Understanding you're not really an expert on the, the 
intricacies of the political history of it. Did you have any idea or did you find anything as to the history of redlining policies? Sure. Um, well, as you know, the 1930s, early 1930s was the, the, the height of the, of the Great Depression. And um, lot, you know, thousands of houses were being foreclosed. Um, they, people couldn't pay their mortgages. And so uh, it was really a disaster. As a matter of fact, my, my mother, that was one of, one of the things that helped put my grandmother over the edge mentally is that she lost her house and her husband within a few years of each other. So what the Roosevelt administration was trying to do was to try to come up with some way to kind of jumpstart the housing market and make housing more available to more Americans. So they created um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation in 1933 with the idea that they would um, make uh, the process of getting a home less onerous. Prior to that, there were ridiculous down payments, sometimes up to 50% that were expected. Um, and they wanted to make loans more available to Americans uh, to be able to buy homes. So this really, this policy really did jumpstart the housing market. It really did help white Americans. Um, Americans were able to buy houses. I forgot I had a number of the millions of dollars that, that were able to be um, um, pumped into the economy because of this. But basically, that was it. They wanted to jumpstart the housing. But they didn't, they didn't want they didn't want to give loans to blacks. So it was just a prejudicial uh, policy. And I think, you know, sometimes they'll say, well, you know, we're just following the, the, the way people feel, we're just making the po our policy based on the way people feel. But making this into policy is what really has da damaged um, African Americans financially and in so many other ways. We had a question from Rory who grew up in Cleveland uh, and said that arson was a big part of blockbusting there. Did you hear of any stories of, of folks burning down their homes for insurance claims or, or terrorism or any other reasons? You know, I didn't hear about that, uh, about houses. I certainly can believe it. Uh, we, my mom writes in her diary um, that the a &P that was a block away from our house was burned to the ground and there was arson was suspected in that. So, I mean, I think this was something that was used as a tool for some people to be able to get insurance when they couldn't sell their homes um, or in this case, the AMP of business. And so that there went, there went a major food supply for the West side. I'm gonna incorporate a couple of questions into one. Um, so we're talking about these various districts and how they are colored. Um, did, you, did you in your research find about um, we saw through some of the general language that there would there would be infiltration of certain uh, subversive elements. Um, did you find examples of how uh, the introduction of a new family would would fundamentally change the um, the grading? And if so, how did, what were those gradings used for in relationship to you? You had mentioned maybe mortgages were they used for insurance? Uh, in what capacities were these um, these red line maps used? They were mainly used as a guideline for banks and real estate agents to determine whether or not a neighborhood was safe to, to get a loan. In other words, obviously, people giving loans want to know their money is safe. Um, but in cases such as we saw the example of the, of the neighborhood um, that, that had the, you know, the best sort of Negroes, as they put it, um, it was just the fact of being black that prevented, uh, that, that caused some of these neighborhoods to be colored red. So the purpose of it was to say to banks and lenders and real estate people, that here's green is a great neighbor. You can, you can lend money for anybody in this neighborhood. Blue, just about anybody, and those would be all white neighborhoods. Yellow, was getting iffy and then red was no. And a black person moving into a neighborhood is all it took for that neighborhood to be labeled yellow. Now these the maps that we were looking at are mostly from the 1940s. So um, as neighborhoods would change over time, these maps would not, they didn't necessarily change with them. Um, but that was the purpose. It was to, to let people know where it was safe, but it was racist in the sense that it simply designated any neighborhood with a black person. In. And I have to say they were, they were prejudiced against seemingly everybody. You saw the comment about the Jewish family. Uh, they'd often make comments about Italians moving in and say pretty soon this could become little Italy. And that was, they, it seemed there was no ethnic group that they didn't have problems with. But um, in general, um, 
yeah, they wanted it to be white, long-term Americans, not these um, fly-by-night <laughs> immigrants <laughs> who came in. Um, uh, a personal question from Ron. Uh, in the book, you talk about your father doing some mapping or cartography. Uh, what was he involved with? Was it related to insurance or a particular field? Well, he worked for a company called the National Board of Fire Underwriters, and they went to cities throughout the country. Now, my father's area was basic, basically a swath that if you took like the center of the city from like Minnesota and go all the way south, so you'd be Oklahoma, Texas, um, Louisiana. Uh, I don't think he went to Alabama. But anyway, his job was to go to these various cities, he and these other engineers, and they would um, actually make, make maps of the city. He would make maps of the city to determine whether or not the city had enough fire pressure. One thing they would test the fire uh, hydrants to make sure that if there were multiple fires, they could, they could handle that. And they'd also just be assessing the city for its, um, again, a kind of a, a worthiness aspect, but this was more related to the quality of the buildings, the way the, the, way the city could respond to, um, to disasters or fires or any kind of thing that was difficult that would be hard to handle. So that was his thing with maps. He liked maps, but he also liked maps. Well, we all he made like maps of the sky. He was sitting, he, he one time made a map of the sky. He was sitting in a field at night and a farmer came out with a gun to ask him what he was doing there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were, we had a question about, uh, has the practice ended? Uh, you had alluded in your presentation that maybe 1968, um, the FHA or a similar organization formally ended um, one process, but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the open-ended, uh, you know, is redlining over? What, what, what is there now? What's left? Yeah, okay, good question. Well, as you mentioned, 1968, the Fair Housing Act was passed and it made it illegal. Nobody could uh, say any longer, I'm not gonna sell this house to you because you're black or I'm not gonna rent to you because you're black. Uh, that became illegal. However, it still goes on in subtle ways. In uh, 2017, there was a study that was done. Uh, it was PBS NewsHour in conjunction with Reveal, the Center for Investigative Reporting, and they crunched about 30 million mortgages through computers to see, you know, who got mortgages. And they discovered that whites are still getting mortgages at three times the rate of blacks. And this is whites with the same financial profile. Um, Blacks and whites who have the same financial profile, the whites will get um, a mortgage at three times the rate that blacks do. And you can look that study up. Uh, it, it won a, um, I think it won a Peabody, either a Pulitzer, it might have won a Pulitzer and a Peabody or just one of the two, but uh, it was, it's called uh, Kept Out is the name of it. You can just Google Kept Out and you can find that, um, that's, that uh, report. It's really interesting. So uh, anyway, it goes on in subtle ways. And then there was something called reverse redlining that when we had the financial uh, crash in 2008, then um, African-Americans uh, often, you know, were, first of all, they, their houses went under at a far greater rate than whites. But also if they wanted to get uh, mortgages, they, they found that they were often steered towards much more expensive mortgages that um, would, would, would they sometimes couldn't keep up with. So. That was, and lost their homes. So that's a, another way. <laughs> uh, we've had a few questions regarding like specific details regarding the history of the uh, HOLC maps. Uh, I encourage you to go to the Mapping Inequality website at the University of Richmond, um, where there's a number of other very interesting um, synthesis of cartographic visualization and data. Um, they're doing a lot of very interesting things on that website. So I would highly encourage um, that you all check it out. Um, so we, we may have a fun time for a few more questions, but I'll go ahead and kick it back over to uh, Ron of the Washington Map Society. Uh, again, on behalf of CMS, I just wanted to thank everybody, all the participating Map Societies, and certainly uh, you, Linda, for, for leading session and gating presentation tonight. Well, thank you guys for inviting me. It was really, it's really fun for me to be able to talk about this, and I'm glad to have such a great audience. Th thank you, Linda, for, uh, I think, a very timely and uh relevant talk. I mean, even though you are talking about the 50s and the 60s, some of the same issues are with us today. Uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm still curious about what your father uh, was doing in terms of mapping. Do you have any records of his mapping? Is that Did that survive in the no. family records? 
You know, the thing is uh, that his, he would have done them for his company. Um, I do not recall coming across any, any of his, the, the maps that he actually made of cities because these, you know, there were no, they didn't even have copying machines <laughs> back in the 50s. So he would just, you know, create these maps. Um, and actually, I remember when I went with, I went with him on a trip, he would take uh, my brother, my older brother or me with him on some of his trips in the summer when we were out of school. When I was nine, I went with him to Enid, Oklahoma. And um, I found his diary, uh, no, his uh, letter he wrote to my mom about that trip in which he said that uh, he had some maps that he asked me that were supposed to be color coded and he asked me to color them. <laughs> it was like a coloring book thing. So he just told me what the colors were supposed to be and then I colored it in. So he obviously was using color coded maps too for some reason, but I'm not sure what those colors meant. Well, on behalf of the Washington Map Society and the other Map Societies, I would like to thank you for the presentation. And we have a few little gifts for you. Oh. Uh, first of all, it's a set of note cards done by a company here in Washington, D.C. It's called Cherry Blossom Creative. Oh, great. And so they've taken Chicago and they have uh, colored in the different neighborhoods. I don't think the colors have any relevance to who's living there. Yeah. It looks great, and, thank you. And then I haven't received it yet, but I ordered a, a, a cut line steel map of Chicago for you as well. Oh. But so when that arrives, I'll send that to you. That is so kind of you, I was totally unexpected. And just, I'm delighted, thank you very much. I'll, they'll, I'll treasure those things, they look great. Okay. okay, I think we can now open the meeting to some just uh, I mean, further questions or just some socializing among um, the people who've attended. Again, I think it's been great to see all, the, all of you attend this meeting. It's, it's, it's encouraging and exciting. Great. Well, I'll be happy to answer a couple more questions, but if you guys want to uh, have a, a nice uh, map-centered yeah. cartography <laughs> conversation. Well, I have uh, two questions that are both map-centered and directly on your presentation. I think it was a fantastic presentation. And it's a great Thank bridge you. between uh, the academic studies that have been done for decades now on this and the kind of personal. I mean, I think your information is absolutely stunning about your own family. I'm glad you uh, were willing to share it in, in many respects. There have been similar documentaries done on Detroit, as you probably know. Um, but it's been done under the the rubric of sprawl in America mm -hmm. and, and white flight. That is the whole movement out of Detroit in that case. And then the riots similar to the ones you mentioned in Chicago in 1968. The current practices you might be wanting to, to um, link to this too are usually from real estate agents and insurance companies that commission their own maps through GIS. Mm -hmm. And they basically take uh, the data of the sales price. That is, there's always in a real estate transaction an asking price and a sales price, a, an agreed upon price. And the gap between the asking price and the agreed upon price can be mapped instantaneously, week by week, in fact, day by day. And so they can see where a community is being fled from and where it's being attractive. <laughs> and when people start buying things as they are now in Cambridge at above the asking price, you can see that that can be mapped very quickly as a desirable neighborhood. Mm -hmm. when, when they're settling for things at a closing price below the asking price, that's considered an undesirable neighborhood. So they don't have to call it redlining anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. a heat, it's a heat map. <laughs> that's very interesting. Yeah, I would. Um... Now, where do you get these these maps, did you say? Well, any any real estate agent can pull them up instantly. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well, we I know when we bought our first house, which is a long time ago, 45 years ago, um, uh, it was that sort of, you had to buy it immediately. I mean, we right. had to make a decision in one day. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be gone. So, I, yeah, we've seen that happen. Right, and, and bidding above the asking price is now happening in places like Cambridge and in San Francisco and all the sort of desirable neighborhoods. At this point, there's a very close attempt to look at the impact of COVID on this. 
Oh, interesting. Uh, because people are moving out of central city places. Right. And sometimes settling for less than the asking price in order to get rid of urban properties. Yeah. So it's, yeah. this is something that's being registered on a daily basis. It's being monitored by real estate agents, you can bet. Uh, so it doesn't need a federal program to uh, put right. in red, green, and blue kind of lines anymore. Every real estate agent is generating this on their own. Hmm. That's interesting. I think the thing that makes it different is that when it's federal government policy, uh, um, then we, ha we have the force of government true. and the government telling us. <laughs> You know, well, I, uh, that's one thing I also, second question I had for you was great. You mentioned and had in your picture, one of your men in uniform. Yes, my now, uncle. The way in which the returning veterans got preferential access to loans is absolutely crucial to the J Detroit case. Because uh, that's the way in effect, the, the white flight was engineered out of this central city to the loans being given to veter white veterans in the suburbs. Yes. Now, I know this again from my own personal situation because I grew up in Levittown, New York, which oh, is the, <laughs> that's the case, the case, yeah, yeah. The, the case study that Frank Snowden, who I mentioned in the, uh, the chat to you, uh, Frank Snowden uh, has studied this right up through COVID-19. He looks at the, the geography of epidemiology. Um, and he's the one who's been focusing on the fact that um, COVID is going to have an extraordinary impact on differential health after, you know, even, well, for decades after the current moment. Yeah, certainly what you said about real, I've read about that too, that everybody is trying, you know, if they can work from anywhere, why do they want to be in a crowded city? Right. Let, let's let's go. Also, I'd like to mention when you said that veterans were able to access these loans uh, and the GI Bill, Blacks were not. Right, they, they exactly. They were kept out from that. Yeah. They, so th this was the ticket for so many families for education. You know, you get an education yeah. with the GI Bill or like you said, get loans. All, virtually all the FHA loans right. went to, sub, to the suburbs. And again, a great big source of bitterness on the part of the Blacks who went into the military expecting to get, in many respects, the same kind of treatment as, you know, as fellow fighters. When they came back, they're slapped by the, uh, the Veterans Administration. And they were, they were terribly mistreated in, in the war, too. They oh, were yeah. given the crappiest materials, the, the right. you know, boots that didn't fit. Um, I, I took a writing course as part of learning to write <laughs> this book. Um, and we had an African-American man who was a veteran of World War II come in and he had written a book called uh, Black Fire. And it was about his experience in the military and how, um, how prejudiced against African-American. And here they are fighting. They would let white German soldiers give them preference over their own black um, military men. That's, you know, they would like to have the, the German soldiers could ride, let's say, in the front of the car or whatever they were transporting in, right. but the Blacks couldn't do that. So that was- Linda, Linda, for another subject, Linda, you want to mention what they did in Oak Park, which was the first suburb west of where you were living to make fair housing. I'm sorry, would you say that again? You want to talk about the Oak Park? Experience. Oh, you want me to mention Oak Park? Yeah. yeah. It's a the other area. Yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert on, expert on Oak Park, but uh, the, the town, the suburb that's just directly west of me about, if I, it's about to walk there, it's about two miles west of where I lived, is called Oak Park. And um, it's a beautiful suburb. Um, and what they did in, um, they, they created what was called the, their own fair housing ordinance in 1969, one year after the Fair Housing Act was passed. And um, they, one of the things they did is they banned for sale signs uh, in front of homes. And um, as we were just talking earlier before the presentation, that was very controversial, but it really did help prevent the white flight. And Oak Park, like I live in a town called Evanston, just north of Chicago, and we have a large black population. The high school is about 40% black, but this town is very segregated. Oak Park does a better job. I'm not saying it's, you know, completely integrated, but it does a better job at integration. And yet, even so, there was a documentary done in the last couple of years about Oak Park High School and how many of the African-American kids feel that they're, um, you know, that they're subject uh, to racism. And it, it's a fascinating documentary to hear the, the kids talk. It's, it's just a really a big problem that America has yet to confront, really. Um, and there are a lot of people who are in total denial. So 
I don't know. What we had a question from Jacqueline um, relating to how have you seen how uh, the process of gentrification has affected certain neighborhoods that have been redlined versus others? Um, and is there a relationship between gentrification and redlining? You know, uh, gentrification is a very, uh, a very controversial topic because, um, of course, people who live in communities um, and that where their rent is low and they can afford it do not want to see the Starbucks come in and have having all the prices go up and be displaced. Um, but on the other hand, you know, one would have to ask, well, does that mean that a homeowner just can't take, you know, can't make money on on his investment? So, in terms of redlining, I you know, I don't think that too many areas that are gentrified are areas that were redlined. They may have been labeled yellow, but a lot of the, like they, like I mentioned earlier, it, 60, at least 65% of um, the areas that were originally redlined are still minority neighborhoods today. And with the other 35%, I'm not sure if any of, I, I mean, I couldn't give you a definitive answer. I think that would be my guess is that Google knows. <laughs> Complicated question, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and hope we will see you all at the next meeting. And thank you very much again, Linda. Great. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, and Curtis, thank you. And Curtis, if the, I see there's like 44 things in the chat room. If you can save them for me, I'd be appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. Okay. All right, so I will sign off. Uh, thank you so much. And Curtis, you were great to work with. I mean, Curtis did a lot of work on this. Uh, so it was really a pleasure to work with Curtis. So thanks again. And thanks to everybody else who, who made this possible. So thank you, Linda. Nice meeting. Bye.